So I'm here with Mitchell Chester. He's the Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education in Massachusetts. Hey, Mitch, how are you today? I'm great, John. Good to uh, be able to talk with you today. Thank you. I appreciate it. So what are some of the things that you uh, as, a, as Massachusetts would like to be focusing on next year? So we're in a, a bit of a transition. Uh, we are transitioning our standards. Uh, so we adopted new standards in English language arts and mathematics back in 2010. And new standards in We've, 2010, so the Common Core, right? And so we're in the process of revising our standards based on six years of experience with those 2010 revisions. Uh, so we are revising the English language arts and math standards. We finished uh, in the last year a revision of our science standards. And in Massachusetts, our science standards uh, incorporate engineering and technology uh, into our standards. Um, and then we're uh, following the revision of the standards. We're in the process of upgrading our assessments. So our, our uh, legacy assessment, the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System, MCAS, uh, has been in place for literally 20 years now. Uh, we are a state that participated in the development of the park assessment. Uh, we invested very much our intellectual capital in that effort. Uh, and so as we build our next generation MCAS tests, we're borrowing strongly from the park development uh, that we participated in, as well as uh, some of our legacy MCAS development to build a test that's aligned uh, to the expectations that are reflected in our, our standards that we're just in the process of upgrading. And what, why, did, why did you decide to, um, to uh, intertwine and build a assessment that was a combination of MCAS and PARC as opposed to transitioning over to PARC or staying solely with MCAS? Yeah, so, so it was clear to me that, uh, that, that, that staying with our, our uh, legacy MCAS was not an option. To me, that was a, it's an outdated test. It's a test that needed to be upgraded. It was also clear to me, based on two years of, of trying out PARC in Massachusetts, and we gave our schools a choice of administering our legacy test or the park test because we weren't going to make a decision on jettisoning our our legacy test without having first tried out the park assessment and 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 the trial yielded a very strong assessment the park assessment uh, raises the bar on expectations requires students to think more to produce uh, knowledge uh, to compare and contrast uh, perspectives on topics to apply their math skills, all, all things that we thought were very positive. But at the same time, there's a strong value in Massachusetts on being in control of our testing program as we go forward and not yielding uh, those decisions to other states and a consortium of states. So it, it, the, the recommendation that I brought forward and that my state board endorsed uh, called for us to draw from that very strong park development, but to customize, not to stick with that off the shelf park version, but to customize to make sure that it was in fact aligned to our, our needs and our standards that were right at the front end of being upgraded. And what's the consequence to the department to, um, to getting, you know, to getting involved in the, in the psychometric development part of that as opposed to leaning on your membership in a consortium? Well, you know, we, we are a state that had a legacy assessment that was widely uh, praised as a high quality assessment. And uh, we had developed a very robust staff in our assessment unit. Uh, so we've got pretty strong capacity in our assessment unit. Uh, and so by going our own way with a next generation MCAS that borrows from the park uh, development work, um, again, my, our staff are responsible for ensuring the quality of the assessment, ensuring the alignment and, and the, the fidelity of that new assessment to the learning standards that we're adopting in Massachusetts. So that's not a trivial lift. But again, we're we're prepared for that. We're we're we've we've done this in the past. We have a, an outstanding staff, so 
uh, that's the work that we've taken on. That's in our judgment, in my judgment as commissioner, that's what is going to serve Massachusetts best. Okay. And what, you know, what did you learn from that whole process of, you know, uh, considering adopting PARC and then deciding to maintain MCAS? What did you learn from that process that you think is valuable for um, other policy folks to, to, um, to, to learn from? Yeah. Um, you know, and not to be flip, John, but um, uh, collaboration is hard. Uh, geometrically uh, increases the complexity of a project. It's hard enough to build a strong, uh, high quality assessment just for your own state. You have to kind of resolve trade-offs, time versus how ambitious the assessment is, uh, the mixture of open-ended items, uh, items that can't be scored by machines against cost. You have all, all these trade-offs uh, that, that you have to make. It's hard enough to get consensus within a state, but when you're working with a dozen or more states, that kind of consensus becomes even more difficult. So, uh, you know, in, in some ways, uh, I, I was one of the strongest proponents of going in the direction of, uh, of having the 50 states have a common definition of what it means to be literate and what it means to know math. I mean, to, to know to, to know math in the in the 21st century and be able to use your math skills to be literate and and uh, bo both reading and writing uh, in the 21st century can't be substantially different in one state than it is in another. And yet we have a system where 50 states were developing their own definitions of of, of uh, competence, of proficiency, and 50 states were developing their own assessments. So I was very much uh, a believer in the value of collaboration and uh, moving away from each state having its own assessment. I think we did a great job with the park assessment of building something that's high quality and, and uh, quite defensible. Uh, but at the same time, the, the core lesson is it's really tough. And at the end of the day, uh, with the park development, and, and this I didn't anticipate early on because it was about a four year um, uh, runway, I would say, between uh, kind of conceptualizing the project, doing the develop more, development work, and then actually having an operational assessment. And maybe two years into the project, if you ask me my greatest concern, I would have said, well, I hope I hope we're going to deliver a, a credible product and actually go operational, because that, that was tough work to get there to lift that off the ground from concept to actual operation. Uh, what I didn't anticipate that in the long run we were quite successful in developing a strong product and moving it into an operational phase. What I didn't anticipate was how tough the governance is when you bring together. Uh, in our case, 12 states at that point. We started out with more than that. And, and the governance issues of uh, licensing, of who holds the license, of how our decisions made, the complexity of that collaboration uh, is just magnified many times beyond what it is to develop a product on your own as a state. That's really interesting. So you just, um, you know, speaking of a common assessment, Massachusetts just um, finished or, or probably last spring finished participation in PISA and the results just came out um, and did quite well in literacy and science a little bit less well in math. Um, what are you what are your takeaways from that experience? Yeah, so you know, as, as I, I hope folks who are viewing this, uh, PISA know no the basics of PISA. PISA is an assessment of 15 year olds in three subjects reading mathematics and science. Each time it's given, it's given every three years, uh, there's a focus on one of the three subjects. So the 2015 administration was focused on science. We had participated in 2012, and in both 2012 and 2015, we participated as an ind independent territory, independent of the United States. The United States participates as a nation. Uh, and, and the results were quite pro uh, provocative. I mean, I, our scores were quite, uh, quite strong uh, in, in reading. Uh, there was no nation that statistically outperformed us in science. Only Singapore did 
in math, 11 nations out of the 70 plus uh, outperformed us. So we did uh, quite well in the rankings, but uh, that's, uh, and that's heartening in some ways, not surprising to me because we have participated before. We are a state that when we do participate in, us, in assessments, uh, we come out quite strongly. So it would have surprised me if we didn't come out strongly. But what's more interesting to me are, are some of the uh, more nuanced uh, in, inferences and insights uh, that, that we're starting to draw from the data. But it's interesting to see uh, Massachusetts stayed strong compared to 2012, very strong. But uh, there were some ups and downs. And in some cases, the, uh, the downs were our lowest poverty schools and the ups were our, our greater poverty schools, um, which a uh, little unclear. Why do we lose ground with our, lower, our, our low poverty schools, schools where very few kids uh, are from low income backgrounds? Uh, but, but it's very heartening to see that we gain ground in our higher poverty schools. Uh, and some of the racial ethnic uh, breakdowns on the scores are, are very provocative as well. One of the, one of the findings that I'm most, uh, most jazzed about, uh, because PISA not only has students uh, uh, respond to the assessment questions, but also has students fill out surveys where they talk about the kind of instruction they're experiencing, in this case in science, in their science classes. Uh, they talk about their attitudes towards science. And when uh, the OECD builds their, uh, their um, uh, statistical models, it turns out that less than 15% of the variance in science scores in Massachusetts is due to students' background, economic and family background. Over 80% of the variance uh, is, is accounted for by what the kinds of teaching students are experiencing, whether or not teachers are explaining science content, are being explicit in their lessons around concepts in science, whether or not they're making adjustments, kind of common sense uh, types of uh, ideas, but it's interesting that many students aren't experiencing that in the classroom and their scores are turning out to be lower, controlling for all the other variables that are out there. So there's a number of insights that we're, we're just starting to call and, and, and starting to, uh, to gather from participating in, this, in the assessment. So uh, I'm curious, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of an investment, I'm sure, for Massachusetts to do this. And so yeah. How did you use the results in 2012 that made you think, wow, this is worth participating in because we learned a lot to do it again in 2015? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I have a very strong conviction that uh, th there's no reason why in Massachusetts we can't expect of our schools and our students what the most aspirational education systems on the globe are expecting. Uh, I see no reason to aim lower than that, and I see no reason why we can't deliver those results. And we've watched our educators deliver strong results for our students. It's always a work in progress. There's gaps that we need to close. Not all students are, are experiencing uh, equal success. Uh, but, but, it, but for me, PISA in 2012 reinforced the fact that, uh, that we should be playing in the major leagues. We shouldn't be keeping ourselves in the minor leagues here uh, because our results were quite strong there. I also realized from the 2012 participation that there was a lot of insight and information that we were leaving on the table. There are additional analyses that OECD can produce for a country or a state uh, province that we asked for this time around that give us much greater insight uh, into the, our results and how they can inform uh, instructional practice, how they can for, inform school decisions, school practices, resource allocation, and so forth. And so it was, uh, I left the 2012 administration saying we need to do this again and we need to uh, mine the data much, much more deeply than we did in 2012. What advice would you give to a researcher um, who wants to? use their work to contribute to the conversation in, uh, in, in your case, in state policy. 
So, you know, we talk a lot about the divide between research and practice and policy. And um, I think that researchers generally want to have an influence on uh, to have their work have an influence on the policy making and decision process. So what advice would you give to folks? So, so first of all, uh, uh, one area where I think CPRI has been absolutely on the front end of, of things is better understanding uh, state systems and the variation in approach in state systems and how that relates uh, to the productivity of the systems, the, the whether or not students are benefiting, the degree to which they're benefiting. Uh, again, because PISA is so fresh in my mind, watching uh, the, the OECD officials unveil the insights into the global education systems and what differentiates higher performers from low performers, I think that's the kind of work at the state level uh, that that that's important in the in the United States. We're a collection of 50 states. The 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 coherence of federal policy only goes so far. And so understanding the nuances, the differences, the comparisons uh, of of state approaches and systems, I think is an area where researchers uh, and CPRI's done a good job of this. Uh, need to keep focused back as to. Uh, what kinds of expenditures have a higher likelihood of, of leveraging stronger improvements in the system? Uh, I think it's, that's an important area for research. And I don't think the education practitioner community is gonna be able to do that on its own. So I would, I would absolutely encourage uh, the research community to focus in this area. Great. Hey, hey Mitch, it's great to see you.